Dollar Arc Angel. Very nice. So where are you? Are you in Stratford or down I'm south? In Walthamstow. What? Uh, north That's made London. Up. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, moved here. Moved from Stratford-upon-Avon to London to try to find success as an actor and writer, only for all the theatres to close owing to plague. <laughs> it's like the 16th century, 15th century. My history is not on point. Yeah. Oh my, you are actually Shakespeare reincarnate. I apparently am at the minute. Hashtag Performing Arts with John Ellis Benton. And in this week's episode... Pip Maguire. So, first of all, let, let's go into the world of Kit. Let's delve Ooh. through the looking glass. Uh, what was it like growing up in Stratford? Um, quaint. Quaint. <laughs> Lovely. It was, yeah, it's it's a very, if, well, you've, you've been to Stratford, obviously. You know, it's very clean. It's very touristy. Yes. Um, I think I was quite lucky in that I have always been interested in theatre, which you can blame my mother for. I think she took me to one of these, like, you know, the toddler, little singy, dancey, let's do some little theatre exercises uh, when I was about two. And uh, I think she was expecting me to stop. <laughs> just, just didn't. She just um, put her foot on the accelerator and then you just carried yeah, on. I just I kept going. So, uh, yeah, I did all the... All the Amdram, all the kiddie theatre groups growing up in Stratford. So I, I had something to do. It's I'm afraid it's probably a very, very boring town to grow up in if you're not into theatre. But I can, Yeah, I suppose if, if you can't stand performance or anything like that, you are yeah. wasted in a town like Stratford. Just got to move. Yeah. So, so it came from your mum. That's where the whole passion of it came from, would you say? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm... I'm basically the only performer in my family um both my par parents are fairly musical like never had lessons but can both play the piano and sing and stuff but yeah I'd say basically my mum like I say took me to these these little theatre groups and it started as a confidence building thing uh and then she always tells the story about one of the other mums when oh can see it on the stage and this is this is me like aged two and a half and my mum's like <laughs> what are you talking about? They're children. But she was right. You, you caught you caught that plague, that particular plague. Caught that plague, definitely. Yeah. Not a bad plague to catch. There are worse no. ones. Far worse <laughs> ones. So what about in school? Uh, was there any sort of uh, drama, anything like that in school? A little bit. Not not so much in school. It was more more the out of school groups. Like um, my primary school didn't really. I mean, they had. I can't remember if we even had school plays. I don't think we really did. Oh, huh? in, uh, in a town like Stratford, they didn't put on plays. I, th I yeah, I think they did. You know, they did the nativity, which was exactly the same every single year, as happens. Yeah, it's that's the same story. I don't know if you're, you're aware of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, no sequels. So uh, but then secondary school, I went to quite an academic secondary school. Um, I don't think they invested very much in the drama department. We had a absolute tour de force of a music teacher um so she managed to squeeze as much out of the budget as she could for herself um <laughs> but drama was kind of left by the wayside a little bit which is a kind of a shame but we managed to make good things with with what we had i think i'll take it when you say she squeezed the budget for herself you're not talking like embezzlement you mean for her subject no no, no. <laughs> she managed to get good good money for the music department as far oh. as i'm aware 
no embezzlement has gone on. That's all right. That's that's reassuring to know that the that's educational system is working. So what about um? So what? Because I met you at Tread the Boards yeah. when you were sixteen, I believe. How, how um, did how did you get involved with them? How did you find out about them? So this is I, I have to again give give credit to my mother here. She's always been very supportive um and trying to find stuff for me and she just she was doing a load of research at the time i was doing my gcse's yeah she was looking around at local theater groups um and pretty much all of them were were amateur and i was most <laughs> already involved with quite a few of them and then tread the boards came up and we went to see one of their shows and i was you know after getting some professional credits as as you are basically just asked whether i could speak to the director or the producer after we saw Peter Pan, which was, um, no, it wasn't Peter Pan, was it? It was the importance of being earnest. And I spoke to Kat, who is the wonderful producer. Uh, and she said, well, if you're, if you're interested in working with us, just send us an email to have a look at our casting on our website and stuff. And basically, yeah, I emailed them. They tend to do a once a year thing. Um, you've probably been involved yourself um, with Shakespeare's birthday where they do monologues and duologues on that little sundial by the river. Yeah. Um, no, it's not an actual sundial. This is not a circus act. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just looks so, pretty. I don't think it's got it a function, has it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't even think it's meant to be a sundial. I don't know why people call it that, but there you go. I reckon there's a thunderbird underneath there. I reckon it's like a screw top little yeah. exit from some underground base. Yeah. That is absolutely, I think you're right. The Thunderbards. The Thunderbards. We need to sell that to ITV. TM, TM, <laughs> TM. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, so you, you got involved through doing the monologues and whatnot. Yeah, basi yeah basically I'd, um, I had this wonderful sort of out of school Lambda tutor um, and she was massively into Shakespeare and she got me massively into Shakespeare which is weird that I wasn't already considering it was Stratford upon Avon <laughs> but there you go and yeah so I was already pretty set on the monologues considering I hadn't had any professional work and they yeah they asked if I wanted to come and join that as sort of like a trial day almost and then after that they cast me in Pride and Prejudice and then I met you doing Frankenstein where I was assistant directing <laughs> that sounds like you walked in a very questionable sort of cupboard session. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, God, that's well, I that's mean, put you some did get on very well with Steve. I did, I did very well. Um, oh God, every time I try and have a sophisticated, sophisticated conversation, something inside me just drags it down to the gutter. Why am I not surprised? I, no idea. It's I'm broken inside. I think you must also be broken inside because you were raised in Stratford upon Avon. There was no drama for you to do at school. Shakespeare was not a thing on your list of interests. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a weird thing thinking about it that, you know, there wasn't really any attempt to foster an enjoyment of Shakespeare in school, in either primary school or secondary school. It was kind of like background noise. We know about this guy. <laughs> he lived here. It's fine. It's why there are all the tourists. That's so weird. Um, yeah, really odd. Like my, my brothers went to a different school, still in Stratford, and they didn't have any Shakespeare at all on the curriculum. I think they did one sonnet. Wow. Like, at least our school, they did try to get us to look at a Shakespeare play every year. And we, we studied a couple for uh, GCSE and then A-level. But still, it's just sort of ludicrous to think that you're you're in Shakespeare's birthplace. What are you doing? Yeah, the town is <laughs> steeped in Shakespeare history and it's not even a thing. They don't acknowledge not, it. I genuinely think it's because it's too close to home. It's literally at home. I don't know. Don't notice your kitchen tiles. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose if you're serving coffee all day, you don't fancy a coffee when you get home. I don't know, but that's very strange. So is it, when you did that Shakespeare's birthday, that would have been the 399th? Yeah, because I did the 400th the next year as well. Yeah, 400th was, was a big one, wasn't it? Uh, Tread the Balls were doing Romeo and Juliet. The town was just full of uh, the world, the people yeah. and their brother. And celebrities, lots of celebrities. Did you did you chase anyone down that day? Um, I I didn't really. Um, I was 
hanging out with a friend and I wasn't originally actually going to do the the monologues on the sundial sundial I'd I'd sort of asked whether I could do it and they were like yeah yeah come along if you have time um but I didn't really have a costume because last time we'd done it in blacks but because it was the anniversary we did it in costume and I ended up stealing I think it was Lady Montague's costume because she wasn't there yeah I look like an about... orange quality street anyway <laughs> <laughs> and with your hair that's just that's with the cherry hair, on top um, <laughs> kissed by fire as is, George yeah, R. R. Martin would put this it is, this is an audio, audio medium so we should specify that I'm ginger <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Um, and I did have a lot of hair at the time as well it was before I cut it all off but yeah it was I didn't I didn't see any celebrities um, I, I feel like I might know somebody who saw Ian McKellen, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I got um, carried away by his security that day. I didn't actually get to... I sort of tapped him on the <laughs> shoulder. <laughs> and then his bouncers sort of like brushed in front of me. I remember the shoulder going into my nose. Like <laughs> It was pretty hard to move through Stratford that day without having somebody bash you in the nose. Yeah, that's true, yeah. But, um, I, you know, wh whether I was taken away by security or not, I, I yeah. claim to this day that I touched Ian McKellen. Not in a... That. Yeah, that's... He's, I'm going to the gutter again. <laughs> <laughs> the people should know what they're listening to. I know. <laughs> but he, I, um, it's going to surprise people to hear me trying to be professional. Um, it surprises me. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> Uh, no, no, that's not like, a compliment, oh, is it? <laughs> like, oh, this is very formal. Yeah, yeah. Um, very, very snazzy. Um, <laughs> so what, I will say, yes, there were there were two things. So no, no celebrity sightings, no touching Ian McKellen for me that day. Um, but two things that did happen. Um, I got interviewed for what I think was Spanish TV. Yeah. Like some regional thing. Anyway, some people there with what I think, I'm not, I wasn't the best at locating accents, but I think they were speaking Spanish, along with English, obviously. After I'd done a monologue, they were like, oh, can we talk to you? Um, and they had a camera, so something happened there. Maybe it was just on the internet. Who knows? <laughs> um, and I'm aware because the, the friend I was with that day noticed it. I was on BBC News, like, for two seconds. <laughs> what, as, as like a, a, someone talking to as the camera? One oh. of the, no, it's one of the like, you know, they're cutting scenes between things and they're going, look, this is what Stratford-upon-Avon looks like at the moment. It's really busy. And I'm just there going, Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, I, I was really annoyed night. that day because I went home and watched the news to see what had, had been said about Shakespeare. And they showed the activities that were going on everywhere. And it yeah. was obviously at a point where I decided to go to the toilet because I didn't make a single clip. Oh. Even though I I was one of the ones stood up there performing and there was nothing. Yeah. It's not fair. That's I think my absolutely. dad was on there. I think I caught a glimpse of my dad. Oh, really tragic. Yeah, it is. So well, where else did you go with Tread the Boards? What else did you do? Because you, you uh, assisted directed Frankenstein in late 2015. Yeah. So, yeah, I AD'd Frankenstein. I was in Panto that year. It was a... A great year to be honest and then i did the kids show the following year um wind in the willows who did you play in wind in the willows i, I, I was a, a lot of people because the way they did it they had uh it was eight people in the cast the four main ones and then uh, the rest of us were doing everybody else i was one of the weasels i was some i think i was multiple rabbits at one point um <laughs> the washerwoman a salesman a yeah just amalgamation of bit characters but it was a lot of fun like some really quick changes in there and you, yeah, you say you did the the panto as well now I, I know from sort of drunken experience viewing uh the panto there's an adult evening for one night in the run that isn't Sorry. like it, it, it's based on the script but it's not scripted and it's yeah. made up. Is improvisation in is a string on your bow? I do like a bit of improv, yeah. I feel I haven't had that much opportunity to do it that much because, I mean, like you say, it's sort of, it's a panto that's loosely based on the one that is being performed over 18s only. 
that said, I was pay- I was playing the princess. It was Sleeping Beauty. I was pray- playing Aurora. And the way they kind of run it at Tread the Boards is that the princess and the prince have to remain straight characters, which is massively ironic. It was Steve and I again. So Steve who played the wonderful Frankenstein. That's, that's the, the doctor, not the monster. So he was playing the prince. Um, we were able to sneak in like a couple of things at, having run them past um, JP, uh, who was obviously directing that year as well. So we sang, we were singing at last, I See the Light from Tangled was our like big romance song. But then we changed it for the adult panto to the song that goes like this from Spamalot. Oh yeah, oh man, yeah, that's a, that's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. That, that I mean, goes it was, high. It does go high. <laughs> um, but that said, like, I, other than, um, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but uh, a certain play slash musical that a certain somebody put on, I haven't had as much opportunity as I would like to sing as an actor. And although there were songs in the panto, um, if you're familiar with Tangled, At Last I See the Light is sort of quite a soft, it's a nice little duet. So it was, yeah, it was quite nice to have a song that I could, we could like properly go for singing sense as well. And the audience really enjoyed it. And then we did the reprise at the end <laughs> <laughs> when we got engaged. Um, so yeah, that was, that was basically the only thing that Steve and I were allowed to improv on but yeah um, because the sort of um uh you, you had mark there who was the sort of wishy-washy character he basically yeah. had free reign didn't he he could do whatever he wanted and he did if i remember correctly and i probably do not because as i say there was a lot of vodka in the audience that evening Shocker. there was a bit where you and the lovely steve were stood still you were yeah. you had to freeze and that was the point mark comes in and there are no rules. Yes. What 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 did he do? So so this was the thing that happened every night in terms of Steve and I kiss, we freeze. He does something to us. Because he he's in love with me and he's sad that I'm kissing another man. Um so like one night he balanced cups of water on our hands. <laughs> um uh, another night he he just properly covered Steve in whipped cream. Um, <laughs> we got we got cling filmed together one night. Yeah, so that rings a bell. As I say it. Um, but on adult panto night, and this was apparently originally he wanted to replace Steve with a girl, but instead what happened was he took me away and put me in the audience. Mark replaced me with my mother. <laughs> to say there is a big family resemblance even though there are a lot of people on adult panto night who are friends with tread the boards and who would have known <laughs> that is that's that's aurora's mum um and then the scene the scene did continue i managed to swap back in but it was just kind of a case of i'm there going i can do nothing about <laughs> this I, I i didn't know if perhaps your mum got herself a, a free smooch that evening <laughs> Yeah. I thought that's where, where that was going. Yeah, it was kind of like he. So, because we're frozen in the act of kissing. Gotcha. He right. Was very insistent on making sure the re, the scene was properly recreated, and I ought to also ought to specify the scene in question. He comes in with the line that he has a gift for me because it's my birthday, and um, rather than you know carrying a little gift bag, which is what he usually did, um, he he had a a box. Um, tied around his waist um, so, so it was kind of oh kind of a sort of pant but with a but, box at the front so um, in every uh, meaning possible he bought you a package he, he bought me a package I see um, did you have to reach into this I did, package yeah. Oh. yeah that's what happened I can't remember how much else he was wearing at the time because I'm aware that by the time the play ended he wasn't wearing anything else yes yeah he, he's got a habit of taking off his clothes but, yeah <laughs> I don't know how quickly that happened so uh, you we tread the boards you did Panto Shakespeare's birthday and then this amazingly talented 
uh, writer director came along with a, a new musical, Zachariah Sheldon, which I invited you to come along and audition for. You did indeed. So um, we had this audition which we held in my flat. You smashed the audition, obviously. When I first met Dean. Yeah, the wonderful, well, the Dean. The Dean. The Dean. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, for the most part, this show didn't do a great deal uh, for portraying fairness and women's rights, especially towards your character. Not especially, no. <laughs> How did you feel about Josephine's roller coaster? Well, it oh, does it count as a ro- as a roller coaster if it just goes down like Oblivion at Alton Towers, where she yes. has a bit at the start where she like she gets engaged. Yeah, everything's lovely. Uh, the love of her life, everything's great. They're singing about lovely, happy songs, and then you reach that precipice, and down it goes, <laughs> um, into a deep dark hole. Um, I mean, it was. The music was great. Obviously, you can't take credit for that. No, uh, no, the music was nothing to do with me, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I, I no, I really enjoyed the script. And um, so, what was it like for you? Because obviously, you, you were the the leading lady role. How I don't know because your character goes through some nasty situations, happenings. Goes through just about every every nasty thing that you can think of. But I think what's really interesting about Josephine is that she still, she never gives up. Worst, worst comes to worst. (laughs) She's there like, well, you have hammers. Yeah, hammer blow abortion. Hammer, yeah. (laughs) By the man she really loves. And then, I mean, certainly in the script that you you wrote and I I very I relished this moment every single night night so thank you for it was the moment where she kind of realizes that this is it she's not getting out of this and rather than trying to backpedal or cow down or whatever she just stands up and says all right you are awful she turns around to her her husband who stole her from from the man she loves bought her paid her for for her forced marriage forced everything else and he's there he's holding a hammer which he is ready to use and just turns around and says you you can you can buy me you can treat me worse than you know you could conceive treating a human being but you will not stop me from making my decisions and it's kind of like he does stop her from leaving he he was never able to have her emotionally uh it is a tragedy but yeah in terms of he's he's there he really believes he's doing a nice thing he's going to treat her very well but cannot understand that she does not cannot will not love him throwing money at her and yeah a house and babies isn't going to change that it's not going to change anything and the fact that there is a man that she does love and that she was planning to marry so he's taken her future from her and trying to force this other one on her. And yeah, so I, d- I did really enjoy that moment with the with the wine. wine. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. It pours it all over the floor. Um, and he's talking about how expensive everything is as well. From your point of view, you are gay, aren't you? I am. Not only is it bad for, you know, like someone to imagine like, okay, I don't love that man, I love that man. But you're playing this character in Victorian times that is, it would have been a completely foreign concept to have the sort of freedom that you have now. I know things still need to be worked on. Did did that did that make it even worse for you, for your thinking? Because imagine then if you were put in that situation. I mean, I guess it's kind of, in one part of it, that is a situation that, I mean, it happened to marriages were arranged and i mean on on the slightly more positive side of it there were such marriages of convenience yeah where you you know you have gay men and lesbians getting married um being friends and neither of them minding a single little bit if something happened with 
other people because that's what what it was there for it was there for, to keep up appearances sometimes they even had kids together because you know whether they wanted to have kids or um again for appearances carry on the family line or what have you um but this is kind of yeah marriage was the done thing as a legal and economic contract with Zachariah Sheldon in particular there is that whole plot of forbidden love like it or not she's married um to one of the wealthiest men in town who everybody else was fawning over it is a proper Gaston and Belle he yeah. continues to have her her relationship with this other boy for as much as she can and I mean that again is a thing that happened in the past in terms of uh where well, you're looking at queer relationships and you would have people who were married who whose husbands had bought them I am the man I will look after her and sometimes you know you you agree to these marriages because it would be more comfortable for you but then sometimes people were able to continue relationships extramarital affairs there are historical people you can look to um this might be slightly controversial slash um unknown um but it's believed that Charlotte Bronte um was not actually interested in men but she ended up having this marriage because it was a expected of her and b she wanted to have children Oh, no, I, I hadn't heard of that. And, and I think looking at that lens, if like if you look at um, Jane Eyre and you have this whole marriage that cannot go ahead and, she, you know, Jane loves him more than anything and it just, it's it cannot happen um, and she will be shamed and shunned for it. Yeah, wow. So, let's move out of Stratford. You're, you've now decided to emigrate down southwards to Londinium. What, what was behind that decision? So um, I, I've wanted to move for quite a while, quite a while. actually. I, try, I tried to move to London three times. <laughs> I succeeded on the third time and then all the theatres closed. I was like, um, basically things didn't line up in terms of trying to get a flat. Um, there was one where I arrived and the person who was looking at the flat before me put the deposit in out yeah but in the end it kind of it worked out really well because the first time i was looking i then got a job a, a tour job that was based in stratford that was kind of like well i'll stop looking for now i'll do this tour and i'll start looking next after the tour finished and i had the whole no you can't live here this man is going to live here i got the cambridge shakespeare festival job which was two months um, living in Cambridge and expenses were paid. So we were given houses, the, the college houses to live in. So that again, it was kind of like, well, I guess it's good. I'm not putting a deposit down and paying rent for somewhere I won't actually be living in. And then it turned out really well because I worked with a guy at the Cambridge Expo Festival called Rule, who I now live with. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, he'd worked with uh, a lovely other actor called Iona um, the year before. So the three of us, found this place in March and um, and moved on in. Oh, great stuff. Was there anything in the pipeline before lockdown hit? Was yes. where, where were you looking? Where, what were you going to? So, so um, um, I was, I, was I, I write as well. And I'd submitted some things for um, various writing competitions. And I'd had um, a couple of short plays I wrote accepted to be performed in scratch nights. Then they were postponed indefinitely. So I'm I'm still at this point, like waiting to hear if that's going to happen. One of them I've decided to adapt into a short film, uh, which I'm going to hopefully shoot with the the help of um, my friend who who did film at uni and and he's he's done a bunch of short films in the past. He's an amazing actor and director. So yeah, hopefully we're going to produce that and slap it online. Um, but yeah, and I've been working with uh, one of my flatmates um, and a couple of other friends to to produce a monologue night that we were going to do like sort of a scratch version of in April. That fell through. So yeah, an unfortunate number of projects in the pipeline that were, it, it was very exciting kind of moving to London and because the whole thing was moving to London because this is where more auditions are. Like I'd had quite a few auditions that I'd had to travel all the way down to London, spend two minutes in the room, travel all the way back to Stratford. Um, which I know some people do but it was just getting a bit much and the fact that you know my other acting friends lived here and we wanted to make stuff together so when when the move was all lined up it was very much looking as though 2020 was gonna be a great year <laughs> <laughs> God, it, 
You don't hear that, do you? Twenty twenty and great year in the same sentence very often. They don't so go you, well together. <laughs> you, you were making a lot of your own work. That's which uh, seems to be the way to go a lot nowadays. You listen, you hear about a lot of people. Um, you know, because there are more people trying to get into the industry than can be sustained by the industry. So making your own work is probably the wisest way to go. So is writing a niche of yours? Yeah, so I've, I've always enjoyed um, enjoyed writing. I know this is a, a theatre podcast. No, no, but, it's, um, it's, it's open. Yeah, Absolutely right. open. Well, um, I, I enjoy writing prose and poetry as well. And um, I'm working on a novel at the moment, which hopefully at some point will go out into the world. Um, no idea at the minute, but yeah, like I have always enjoyed writing. Um, and I've got a bunch of theatre and um, I've got a TV pilot as well that I'm trying to get out there. So part of it is just about expanding your CV. You kind of like I'm submitting short stories to magazines and like I say, this I'm producing this short film. But, you know, if you're telling me in March that these three things that I had lined up in April that were going to go bam, bam, bam on the writing CV, all yeah. three fell through. But hopefully we will pick them up again and work, rework them, find a way to, to still build that up. But yeah, I mean, I think at the moment, definitely making your own work is, is a massive thing. I mean, Phoebe Waller-Bridge with uh, Crashing and then Fleabag is one of the most well-known TV shows in Britain at the minute. She's responsible for Killing Eve as well, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, she did yeah. series two of Killing Eve, um, which of course she wasn't in herself, but... Yeah, I mean, it is it is very prevalent at the moment. And that's what, I mean, if you go to Edinburgh Fringe, everyone's got their own show. Like, they're all all things that are being written. Um, yeah, but, there's but, absolutely but if, uh, an abundance of evidence to suggest that what you're doing will work, can work. Yeah, it can, it has. <laughs> yeah. um, hopefully it will for me. Yeah, that must but have been yeah, a tremulous time back in March, though. When he first said, right, country's going into lockdown, you've just moved down there. You've got to pay for, uh, you know, a roof over your head, um, mm. food and shelter. What What was your reaction then when he was like, you know, your job, you can't do it? Yeah, so uh, that did suck, as it did for pretty much everyone. <laughs> um, but obviously, understandable why it had to happen. Essentially, there was, it's kind of, you know, you can have option A or option B and they're both bad. Um, I was back up with my parents um, when lockdown was announced because it was Mother's Day that weekend. Um, okay. And I had only just moved, but it was kind of a case of, well, I'd like to spend Mother's Day with my mother. I've only just moved out. Obviously, this is, um, I'm, I'm lucky to have a really wonderful relationship with my mum. So, and then it was announced the Monday after, and I was meant to be going back on the Tuesday. And it was kind of a case of, well, I've got to decide do I want to drive down to London, live in a place that I've only just, you know, I don't know, I didn't know Walthamstow at all at the time. Um, and although I had lived with Rule for two months back in Cambridge, um, Cambridge was very much kind of like a, a bubble working holiday type thing. There is a certain anxiety about living with people you've never spent that much time with. I'm sure, yeah. Iona was spending lockdown with her parents because she has asthma. So she didn't necessarily want to be in the city. So I decided to stay at home with my parents back in Stratford so there, yeah it was the case of kind of all right I'm with my family so I don't have to worry about not seeing them um, my brothers were there at the time as well and you know I, I don't have to worry too much about buying food and laundry detergent and everything else so that was quite nice the downside was of course I was paying rent for a flat that I wasn't living in yeah um for several months so that wasn't great <laughs> but and the other thing was that I just left my previous job to move and I hadn't had a, got a job in London yet because, I mean, these these other things were going to keep me afloat for a while while I found a day job. Um, or who knows, maybe even just carry on writing and get things. I don't know. Um, but so I ended up working in care for lockdown, essentially. Um, at, there was a, a little care home um, in, well, just out, in one of the villages that surrounds Stratford, which was very, very different from everything else i've ever done yeah it's a hell of a sidestep <laughs> yeah but yeah so essentially that was that was how i i kept afloat while i was um 
while lockdown was happening. And then when I did manage to move to London, I transferred to another home. Um, but it was just a very different atmosphere and I was working nights and I ended up looking for another job that would kind of suit the my schedule a bit more because I, I was only working two days a week or two nights a week. Um, but in care, that's 22 hours because it's 12 hour shifts. Um, but the way the shifts were kind of spread out as well meant that I just wasn't able to get my body clock any sort of rhythm to it because it was like I'd have to be up all night to do this shift on Tuesday and then I had three days off and then I'm on Friday night and then another three days off and yeah that's that's not a very healthy no, no I kind of <laughs> got to the point where I just wasn't sleeping and I was like I I need another job <laughs> <laughs> and and I kept trying to write so like like I mentioned this novel actually started at the beginning of lockdown I just started writing and now I've got a chunk of a book I managed to finish writing the first series of my sitcom. Um, if anybody Excellent. who works in television is listening to this podcast, please contact me about Birthplace. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But, Hopefully. Um, Fingers crossed. So when, when the first initial lockdown started to lift, when, you know, the, the sun was coming back up on Britain and everything was going to be wonderful and perfect. And we um, helping out. Yeah, e eating out to help out because that that worked that was such a good idea that was such a good idea and also a well thought through slogan <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we were all um eating out and <laughs> as were, were things starting to pick up because theaters still weren't reopening but were there glimpses were there lights at the end of the tunnel yeah yeah so um this was the other thing actually uh that i mentioned earlier i was incredibly lucky to get an acting job through lockdown yeah so there's this company will and co their show bard in the yard which i mean when they were first auditioning it was very hush hush because it was kind of like we're they're a, a wonderful little company that's like award-winning does tours in europe and stuff but comparatively to say you know the national or the barbican or what have you a little company and it's kind of like we don't want somebody with more money than us working out what we're doing and stealing it so the casting note was literally if you're interested in shakespeare if you're if you're good at shakespeare send your cv and yeah and thankfully from knowing little to nothing about shakespeare throughout your career you've, yeah, yeah. You've, like you said with your monologues you can just Someone says, give us a Shakespeare monologue. You're like, okay. Think Boom. Away. Um, I mean, that was the thing we didn't mention. I did work at Shakespeare's birthplace. You did, yeah. Yeah, where you just sort of, it was, you were uh, like a Shakespeare it, monologue jukebox. Yes, exactly. So it was literally pick a play and if we know it, we perform from it. But yeah, in that sense, like I do, I went back and I realised my last four or five jobs I have are Shakespeare based. Um, so yeah, I went from being like, oh yeah, he, he wrote some plays to fully i owe my career to this man <laughs> so yeah it was it was kind of you know if you're good at shakespeare contact us and we might audition you so i sent this email um saying hello i am i owe my life to shakespeare <laughs> um and they yeah they were very good it i will say they were amazing as well because i was working the weekend of the auditions so i just i did say in my email i'm i'm working 12 hour shifts both days i would but i would still really love to audition can I please audition on the Friday or the Monday? And they let me. So that was really wonderful of them. Brilliant. I'm eternally grateful for that. So yeah, they they auditioned and it was a slightly weird audition because I did um, Lady Percy from Henry IV Part Two, And then, so you, you, as you know, you often get redirected in auditions, partly yeah. to see how you take direction, partly to see if, you know, you'll work for this particular production. And the redirection I got was, imagine that you're in the globe, but you're performing for six people. Okay. And it was quite interesting because they were they asked quite a few things about my experience performing Shakespeare or performing outdoors, which the Cambridge Shakespeare Festival is an outdoor festival. Yeah, as over, was a lot of so your work was, at Shakespeare's birthplace, wasn't it? Because it was in the garden. Shakespeare's birthplace was entirely outdoors as well. And the other question was, are you you how do you feel about performing for small audiences? Um, and those who are not familiar with the Attic Theatre in Stratford upon Avon, where Tread the Boards are based, um, it is comparatively a small theatre. 70 odd seats it's a lovely little fringe theater so i was kind of there like aha i know both of these things <laughs> <laughs> tick tick so uh yeah i did that which was great 
um and then yeah get, getting this email saying okay so what are you going to be doing if you we'd like to have you your mission should you choose to accept it go to people's houses basically people would book this show it's a 40 minute solo show socially distanced from the audience that people booked to come round, go into their back gardens and perform some Shakespeare. Wow, okay. Bard in the yard. Uh, yeah, like it. The actual role and the play, the 40 minute play, well, 45 roughly, but yeah, you know. Um, I and the other bards that were cast are playing William Shakespeare himself, trying to write King Lear in lockdown. And you go through asking, and it's kind of like a highlight reel of Shakespeare's greatest hits. So like you start with Henry V, uh, and then there's Romeo and Juliet in there and, you know, some of Shakespeare's best women have a little like a montage. And then there's some of the lesser known ones as well. Two gents is in there. Um, and in the meantime, you're going through and you're talking about life in lockdown, life under plague and popping in like bits about Shakespeare's life. His um, talking about his children, how plague has affected him. Um, and it's basically just a really great show for Shakespeare lovers. And where some of them had been booked as like gifts for people. Um, so there were definitely a couple of sort of like retirement or, or birthday gifts where somebody booked a bard to come round. But yeah, it's, it's been a really interesting experience. Technically, we are still going. It was it was going to end at the end of September, uh, but there was still interest. So, I mean, things yeah. have eased off a bit because of the weather. But there we go. It's, it's plug time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> Bard in the Yard is still going. It's bardintheyard.co.uk, and you can book a bard to come to your garden and perform some Shakespeare. Um, it was originally London based, but because obviously my parents live in Stratford, um, and I did mention that I have a base in Stratford, apparently we had enough questions from people living in the Midlands um, asking, hey, would you send someone up to us? that they, they hired another team and um, I am one of two bards on both teams. Excellent. So I do London shows and Midland shows. That's a, that's a really cool idea. And yeah, it, it's so nice it's... that it wasn't a big thing that came in and, you know, a big corporate thing that came in, swooped in and started the idea first. I think it's nice that it was yeah. a little company. Yeah, I, yeah, it's really great. I do think as well sometimes those, the the bigger companies like the National and stuff can be too big to move, you know? It's kind of like... They've got all of these levels of, of things you have to go through with um, just getting a show past the idea phase. Red tape. So much red tape all over the yeah. place that it would have been, I think, probably really difficult for a larger company to go, well, we'll have a collection of actors who go out and form this solo show in people's gardens. Like the health and safety aspect of that. Well, we did have, obviously, we have had health and safety all sorted out and uh, yeah, we've you know, contracts and risk assessments and everything have been done. For that to be done for such a large company would have been a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. But it's not. It's nice to know that even through these dark times, there's uh, there are companies out there still managing to do it. Because I haven't heard that idea. And you know, uh, how long's lockdown been now? Since March, it's seven, seven, eight months. So I, I think that's that's a wicked idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, I sure. can't go anywhere without of course talking about uh last supper we cannot we cannot indeed small scale of yeah. course it was debut film by film that's by a film company that's just started just got a film out there yeah but we worked very hard yeah. on it what, what was it like for you tell us about your character and about your experience um well i i, I would be remiss to um not mention how cold I was. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would be the first thing. Cold. Um, yeah. Very enjoyable. It was very enjoyable. But um, yeah, I mean, I I had had a couple of like days on a similar kind of set for some short films um, that this this wonderful guy in Worcester produces. But yeah, you're right. It was my first my first feature film venture. Yeah, over one weekend. We three had three days, 12 hour days. days to film it. Little monastery. Yeah. Um, with no heating, or the whole room would turn red. Oh, <laughs> it, it was horrendously yeah. cold. Oh, it was freezing. And you had um, no shoes or socks on either. I had I had nothing on, practically. We had your character, Seri, who is. Um, she is a seductive, 
she, she, she is, is the entity, entity of, of um, temptation, uh, temptation, like, like temptation, temptation yeah. personified. Um, so you were in a very skimpy outfit that looked stunning, of course. You scored up well. Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> Backhanded uh, compliment there for you. <laughs> oh, I'll take it on the cheek. So yeah, you were in a skimpy outfit, no shoes, no socks. No, I mean, obviously in the in the film, in the script, she's literally the personification of temptation. Um, but I, yeah, she's such an interesting character in that sense is that she's there like her job is to tempt Joseph so that he will commit the his final sin and I mean it's never actually uh, explicitly said it's up to you to draw whatever conclusion but um, so that he will be condemned I suppose yeah it's, yeah, it's open, open to interpretation, to interpretation. it was ne I don't I think because uh, uh, Dean wrote it obviously Dean Sheridan is um, he obviously has his idea of it and he likes his plays where the audience make up their own ideas but the impression you get is that it's some kind of a limbo. It seems to be some sort of purgatory. Yeah, and Joseph Where... is having his final, his judgment day, basically. Yes, because because he hadn't, he, he was hung in the balance, is in that he had not, he had repented, but he, he'd still committed some terrible, terrible acts. Uh, and Sarah is that I found it interesting as well that she's Sarah, short for Seraphim, one of the if you're if you look at tiers of angels, one of the most important angels are Seraphim. Um, you've got cherubim, Seraphim. Straight. Next one up. Yeah. Yet she is there working for, sort of working for somebody who, again, it's up to audience interpretation. Is he the devil? Is he a different personification of temptation? Anyway, he's not a good entity. No, he wants to keep Joseph there. Yeah, he wants Joseph to be condemned or whatever to 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 repent his repentance yeah. <laughs> to prove that. <laughs> Um, humans are, at the end of the day, weak. Weak. Absolute <laughs> sods. But then you've also got that layer of Seri wants Joseph to succeed. Yeah, it's like she, because it, it, it's, it's found out later on that she's already sort of condemned. Uh, it sounds like yeah. she failed her judgment. Um, so although she gives in to her most base desires, she actually quite likes Joseph and wants him to pass this test, but uh, should should yeah. he decide to not do so, she will also reciprocate. It, it's 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 very sort of sexual tension. I think yeah. is probably the best way to describe it. Yeah, there is is definitely, which is obviously all set up in the fact that she's introduced as here is a sexual object for you, but then they end up cultivating a real relationship and I, I think from from Sari's point of view it certainly seems that there have been other potential men in terms of I mean from without giving too much away Sari does have her own motivations why she wants Joseph to succeed and I think from the way I played her originally she wanted somebody to succeed and it seems like it might be able to be Joseph yeah he might be able to pass this test as they go along and he continues to resist but I think also as they go along and they spend this undefinable amount of time together in this dark room in a monastery in Coventry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no doors, just walls. No, doors, no up, no, no down. Just, yeah, and just these candles and this rotting fruit. And as Joseph continues to resist temptation but it's not just that i i mean obviously you played joseph so you know him better than me but from seri's point of view is that he resists temptation not just for the sake of resisting temptation but because he believes he can be a good man he also stands up to the dark lord on his dark throne um, <laughs> and he yeah you know he he really believes in redemption and i think by the end of the film it's not just that seri wants to have somebody pass the test um for her own selfish means she genuinely wants Joseph to succeed. She wants Joseph to to pass on to better things. Yeah, but again, without um, without um, giving anything away, the last couple of seconds of the film question that as well. Turn that on its head. Yeah. What's her motivation there? Yeah, exactly. That's that's kind of the thing that I I certainly for me playing it, knowing how it ends. Um, it was kind of, I mean, there's obviously that thing in acting that you can't play. You have to avoid playing what your character doesn't know is going to happen. But because it is, I mean, I don't think it gives too much way to say it's cyclical in nature. 
just because you know in terms of the material that it's based on it is you know the whole religion is very cyclical Sari wanted um the last couple like the last few moments of the film is Sari's ultimate goal so while she doesn't know that will happen like I was very aware of Sari's own selfish desires but I think as it went on because Sari's not a good person no she never, she's got good qualities like, she she does but I think by whilst at the end of the film she is still driven by her own ultimately selfish motivations I think she the way I was playing it at least is that she's glad in her heart that it was Joseph of all of the the trash that has <laughs> come through this little hole yeah the whole scummy flotsam and jetsam that have come along exactly that it's it's not just that oh this guy did manage to you know he he stands up and he spends the film resisting this temptation that by the end of it she it's very personal she wants him to succeed because they've got to know each other they've admitted the darkest parts of themselves yeah and thus been able to see the lightest parts yeah yeah the, the, the yin and yang kind of he's the good guy with yeah. terrible qualities she's the terrible person with good qualities yeah exactly so yeah i, I think i think the film was a success and I, I hope uh, when when all this lockdown is over, the industry has a lot more positive things for you. Now that you've made all these commitments, <laughs> hopefully something will come through. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. I I really hope so. I, I just want to say I hope um, wonderful things also happen for you. Thank um, you. I cannot wait to see this podcast get launched into the stratosphere. But thank you for that. You are an absolute gem. Well, I do thank appreciate you for it. Me. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always. <laughs> Lovely to speak to you, and uh, don't be a stranger. You've been listening to Hashtag Performing Arts. A Dumber Archangel Sounds Production. Produced and edited by John Ellis Benton. Music by Aaron Crowder. Next time. Was there, was there any sort of uh, trepidation? Because obviously, world of wrestling, it's sort of big, it's masculine. Um, you know, I, I didn't. Want, I wondered if there was going to be any sort of repercussions or sort of comebacks for being out there in that way. I mean, like anything, there's always the odd comments. Um, obviously, like myself, like obviously I'm not. Obviously, with Drago, think obviously they it gets a lot of links to obviously the LGBTQ community. Um, most drag artists may be gay men. Um, obviously, and that, that, that's not me, obviously. Um, and obviously, some people question that, like, oh, was I doing it to take the mick or being offensive? No. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm someone that's a big supporter of the LGBT community. Um, so that's quite surprising. I wasn't expecting uh, criticism to come from that side. I thought it would be from the side of, like... So I had both. Um, so yeah. that was one. Some people thought it was like some people would question like why I was doing it, and it was more of like for me, it was more like I was doing it to to show people like you can be who you want. Don't be afraid. Like if you choose to dress dress as a woman or choose that, you can do that. Dumber Dark Angel. <laughs>